Okay, well, if we could turn, please, in our Bibles to the book of Revelation, chapter 2. We're going to read from verse 12 down to verse 17. And we're going to be looking at Pergamos, uh, the church married to the world, the compromised church. So verse 12, it says, To the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things saith he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. I know thy works, and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is, and thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith. Even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. And again, God always adds a blessing to the reading of his precious word. Now, before we uh, look at this particular church, uh, I wanted to, again, just mention something about the history. Uh, we said that these are uh, written to real churches, but there's a historical uh, significance to each of them, that they, it's kind of like God had written a church history curriculum in advance. And we didn't spend a lot of time last time when we looked at Smyrna, uh, looking at the historical uh, kind of persecutions that occurred. We mentioned just one thing, and I, I want to just pick pick up where I left off last time, and that is a, a quotation from uh, a man called Tacitus, uh, and he said uh, he was a contemporary with Nero, and he described Christianity in this way as a detestable superstition, which at first was suppressed and afterwards broke out afresh and spread not only through Judea, the origin of the evil, but through the metropolis also, the common sewer in which everything filthy and flagitious, um, marked by scandal and vice, meets and spreads. Now, why was Christianity considered to be so scandalous? Why was it such a detestable superstition in the minds of people? Because it, you think of, we think of true Christianity of being moral and upright and, and godliness, holiness, all these things. And yet they were accused of, uh, of superstition and of basically being like a sewer. So how did this accusation come against the Christians? Well, for several reasons. First of all, it was common to accuse the Christians of incest, which sounds shocking, but if you think about it, what they would say is they would not, you know, kind of marry anybody unless they were a brother or a sister. Now, you know what we mean by that, right? Brothers and sisters in Christ, but to the, the uneducated, unsaved, these people are viewed as incestuous, and so that was one of the, the uh, accusations that was leveled against them. Uh, another was that they were the first people, now this might shock you, but they were the first people on the earth to be called atheists. And the reason they were called atheists is because they did not believe in the pantheon of the gods, right? Every, most Roman citizens believed in all of these different gods, and they rejected them all. And so they got the, 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 the um, accusation that they were atheists. They didn't believe in the gods because uh, they believed in the one true living God, uh, eternally existing in three persons. But nevertheless, in the minds of the unsaved, they were atheists. And then they were accused of cannibalism because every Sunday they, they met together. And again, what was their, their ceremony? This is my body, which is broken for you. 
And so, you know, they were accused of cannibalism because they were eating the body and drinking the blood of Christ. And, and again, that's how their minds worked. And so they had this uh, terrible reputation. Now, <clears throat> we're not going to go through all the 10 periods of persecution, but I just want to mention one. The first 300 years of the church, I want just one, one incident. Uh, there's many more, and uh, <clears throat> certainly, uh, Lord willing, uh, later on in the year, I'll be up in your neighborhood in Charlottetown. I'm going to be teaching uh, on church history over a whole weekend, and we'll go into a lot more detail on some of these things. But uh, uh, in the province of Gaul, in Lyon, which is in present-day France, there was a slave girl called Blandina. This is 177 AD. She was 15 years of age. She was bound to a stake and wild beasts were set on her. According to legend, they did not, however, touch her after enduring this for a number of days in an effort to persuade her to recant. She was led into the arena to see the sufferings of her companions Finally, as the last of the martyrs, she was scourged, placed on a red-hot grate, enclosed in a net, and thrown before a wild steer who tossed her into the air with his horns. In the end, she was killed with a dagger. But for all of that, she would not deny her Lord. And she just won. Can you imagine today a 15-year-old girl taking such a stand for the Lord Jesus. It's just staggering to think of. And I could tell you many other stories. Uh, it, it, it's uh, uh, Fox's Book of Martyrs would detail a lot of these things. Uh, incredible, really, what people suffered for the cause of Christ. So that's Smyrna. Now we get to this next church, and <clears throat> this the, in what we call Pergamos. And um, the name Pergamos literally means thoroughly married. And it, uh, the names of all these churches had great significance, um, as we know. Um, uh, and so, uh, of course, we talked about Smyrna coming from myrrh, which has the idea of suffering. But so this thoroughly married, um, very great significance. And <clears throat> the, the difficulty was that the church at Pergamos was thoroughly married, but not to the Lord, but to the world. <laughs> It was a compromised church. And this is a very serious thing. We're, we're told to come out and be separate from the world uh, and to be different. And I just want to read a scripture, one that we've looked at before in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Uh, but this is really where the heart of the problem lies uh, in what was going on in Pergamos. 2 Corinthians 11 in verse 2, we read this. He says, for I am jealous over you. He's speaking to the Corinthian church. I'm jealous over you with a godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. And so when a church, which is espoused, as it were, betrothed to as a chaste virgin to Christ, and of course, we're looking forward to that marriage supper of the Lamb, the book of Revelation. We're going to see it. But when that church actually is in love with someone else and married to someone else, well, that's that's a great affront. It's adulterous. And so the church um, <clears throat> here is unfaithful in Pergamos. And, and what they've done is they've married the world. And so... <clears throat> We're going to look a little bit about this, this place called Pergamos and learn a little bit about the background and what, what caused this unfaithfulness. <clears throat> Pergamos was the home of a multitude of heathen temples. It was also famous for its large library of somewhere between 200,000 and half a million books, depending on who you read. So, so very both uh, pagan society because of all these idol temples, but also very academic society uh, with, with this big library and, and the learning attached to it. And so the uh, second largest library of the ancient world was in the city of Pergamos. 
is also the place where emperor worship, now remember we saw that it began in Smyrna, but it really took off in Pergamos. In fact, they had two temples dedicated to emperor worship. Uh, one of them built in 29 BC was dedicated to Augustus, a living emperor, but who was to be worshipped as divine. It also uh, was a center of a healing medical cult. Uh, there was a, a temple uh, to this guy, um, Asculapius. Asculapius. Now, Asculapius uh, actually was a, was a, a well-known doctor, physician, and um, when he died, uh, he was deified. Now, they were good at making men into gods. And so he was deified and a temple was erected to the god of healing, of this man Asculapius. And of course, the symbol, which has been adopted by the American Medical Association, is a serpent on a pole, which is interesting. Uh, that is the symbol that was associated with Asculapius. And so in his temple, snakes roamed freely. That's why the serpent on the pole is significant. And a sick person who stayed in this temple overnight. Now, you'd have to be pretty sick <laughs> to stay in a temple full of snakes. Uh, I have to say, my only snake that I like is a dead one. And uh, so just imagine this. You're in a temple full of snakes. And if a wandering snake touched the person during the night, the promise would be that he would be healed. So this, this notable physician, uh, physician um, uh, also connected with Pergamos, was all kinds of uh, healing practices that went along with this. So it's just kind of interesting. I want to just say this, that um, I, I just wonder, because we're going to see later on, it was where Satan's seat was, Satan's throne. And I just wonder if what we see in Pergamos is what we're going to see in the end times. We're going to see big government is worshipped, just like emperor worship. We're going to see that the medical, what we say, pharmacia, is also going to be worshipped. <laughs> and, and then paganism as well. And these three, I believe, are going to come together in the end times and make the world ready for the man of sin. And of course, uh, everybody wants to be well. And so uh, we're, we're willing to submit to things uh, and give ourselves into things that may not be good for us. Uh, <clears throat> and again, I, I do believe that uh, things like our medical history is all going to be uh, put on that I, the iPhone in a coming day and our ability to buy and sell is based on the fact that we've had all the necessarily necessary shots and all the rest of it. So I, I see all these things coming together and uh, maybe <clears throat> you might not like what I'm saying, but I, I'm absolutely convinced that those three things are going to come together in the end times and behind it will be Satan. Pergamos was not on a trade route and it had no harbor so it really had to work hard to gain wealth. And so it, its means of doing it was that it was a university city and also because it was a center of pagan worship and also because of its medical aspect. And so those three things contributed to the success of the city. And of course, along with that, there was great academic pride, which is so often the case uh, where you have universities and all the rest of it, center of pagan worship filled with sexual immorality. And sometimes, again, we, I think we feel like we're living in unique days. And one thing that studying the past tells us is it's not unique. There have been days like this before. The Christians in Pergamos face the same things we face. They face exactly the same challenges that we face today. So it's good to just remind ourselves that it's not necessarily the hardest time to be alive right now. Uh, also, uh, the other thing about this city was Satan's seat was there, Satan's throne, <clears throat> where Satan dwells. Now we're going to look at it when we go through this uh, verse by verse, but we're just kind of setting the scene. What is this place like? And we're told <clears throat> 
that this was the center of his operation in the world at that hour. And of course, we need to remind ourselves that Satan is not omnipresent. Sometimes I think we're in danger of almost deifying Satan. We know that he's real. We know that he's powerful, but he is limited. He can only be in one place at one time. Now, he's got his emissaries that work for him, and so he has agents in many places, but he himself can only be located in one geographical location at, at one time, and we see that right now, uh, at this, as this is written, <clears throat> he is in Pergamos, and so certainly uh, a lot of question is, well, where exactly was his seat, his throne in Pergamos? Some believe it was connected with the, the rabid emperor worship that perhaps because one day uh, Satan is going to be worshipped through a man uh, when we look at Revelation chapter 13. And so that perhaps that's the idea. Uh, some see it in uh, his, uh, his corruption of the academic world or even the medical world. But, but wh whatever way it is, his throne was in Pergamos and the Lord knew that. So... <clears throat> We, remember we talked about church history we, we've we've seen the the early church lose its first love we've seen a period of great persecution uh, 10 successive stages of persecution and it didn't work in fact it had the reverse effect uh, one of the things that persecution tends to do instead of wiping out the church it tends to strengthen the resolve of the church. And, and often, and you read testimonies of people who put faggots on the fire uh, to burn the, uh, the believer uh, as they witnessed their testimony were actually converted. <laughs> and so it, it was really backfiring. And so uh, after this, these 10 periods of persecution, Satan realized that the persecution wasn't working and in fact, the opposite was true because it was a, a, a pure church, a growing church throughout the empire, uh, despite the fury of the roaring lion. So after the death of Emperor Diocletian, the one that has sent John to the Isle of Patmos, there was a battle took place historically to see who the next emperor would be. And there were two potential candidates, a man called Maxentius, and a man called Constantine. A battle between these two men uh, and their armies, respective armies, was fought in a place called Milvian Bridge, very famous in history, uh, between these two rivals. And the, the winner would basically become the emperor. The night before the battle, Constantine saw a vision in the sky of the cross bearing an inscription and the inscription said this, by this sign, conquer. That night, Constantine, as it were, made a bargain, I believe, with Satan. But he thought he was making a bargain with God. And he said if he won the battle, he would declare himself a Christian and join the church. Well, as we know, Constantine did win the battle. and. Uh, he called a special church council, 325 AD. It was called the Council of Nicaea, the, the Nicaean Council, 325 AD. And the purpose of it was, um, first of all, to, uh, to declare that he had accepted Christianity uh, and that it, he was going to make it no longer a persecuted uh, minority, but actually uh, going to officially give it the backing of the state. But also because within the church, there was a dispute going on. And that dispute was concerning some very important doctrine. And that was who Christ was and who the Holy Spirit was. Because there was a very eloquent preacher called Arius. And this man, Arius, he basically, very eloquent uh, he basically uh, asserted uh, that Jesus wasn't God, uh, that there was only one God, and that was God, Jehovah, 
Uh, Jesus wasn't God, and neither was the Holy Spirit. And so th th there's a battle to discuss that. We're going to talk about that more as we go through the passage. But just, just for our purposes in terms of history now, I want to just say this, is that Christianity became the religion of the state. Because of the conversion of Constantine, he basically forced people to be baptized or face the sword. Now the pagans are the ones who are being persecuted, and the church with the arm of the state is doing the persecuting. And so basically, millions of unregenerate pagans were baptized and became part of the church. Now that is an unmitigated disaster. Because you've got all these unbelievers now, part of the church. It's now a mixed multitude. And um, the, the bishops who have had basically, you know, two centuries of persecution, they actually carried Constantine on a golden throne on their shoulders and declared him to be the head of the church. And so the very beginnings of what we call the papacy go back to Constantine. And um, the marriage of the church to the world and the worldly emperor was without question the greatest disaster that ever affected the church. And we're still dealing with the mess that Constantine made to this very hour. A billion souls are wrapped up in that system called Roman Catholicism which had its origins back here, yeah, where uh, acknowledging the Pope. So the heathen still honored Constantine in their temples, but now the Christians also honored Constantine in their churches. Everything was compromised. And that is the burden of this letter. Okay, we've got to keep that in mind. It's a compromise, a compromised church. And so as we d dive into the letter, notice verse 12, how the Lord reveals himself to this church. It says, to the angel of the church in Pergamos, write, these things saith he, which hath a sharp sword with two edges. So what a description of the Lord. <laughs> He's the one that's got this sword. And remember, we said it's not exactly the same as Hebrews 4.12, which was a short sword. But this is a five foot long battle sword that is used to create carnage on the battlefield when it's in the correct hands. And so symbolically, it's the judging power of his word. Because remember that uh, often the, 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 it's referred to as the word of God, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And so basically, uh, God is uh, God, the son, his word is has to be the standard of all doctrine and practice in the christian church everything that does not match up to his standard must be dealt with ruthlessly and the word of god is that which determines how these things are to be dealt with and so then he, he goes on and he talks about i know thy works and where thou dwellest and that is encouraging to know isn't it the lord knows where we live he knows exactly where we're at and, and particularly encouraging for these believers, because he says, I know where thou dwellest, where Satan's seat is. And so that's the issue. He, he knows that, that this, is, this is the center of, we talk about principalities and powers, and we're wrestling with principalities and powers, but as it were, the, the head of this, this rebellious spirit world actually makes his home in the same city where the church is and so what a challenge for these believers that in this very city and yet despite that he does commend them for certain things he, he says to them thou holdest fast my name so it's a place where satan's seed is and thou holdest fast my name so although pagans came into christianity there was a clarifying during this time historically of cardinal doctrines and we talked about this council of nicaea and we talked about this brilliant orator 
called Arius. And he was up against a man called Athanasius, who was not as eloquent. So you've got this competition. Uh, you know, they were trying to win the effect. All the bishops are gathered together in, in Nicaea, and Arius and Athanasius are having a public debate in front of the bishops. And this is going to determine the whole direction of the way Christianity goes. And so Arius, despite his brilliance, denied the real deity of Christ, believed he was a created being. Uh, in fact, uh, to this day, the followers of Arius continue in the Jehovah's false witnesses. They may come knocking at your door. That's where it goes back to. They believe Arius was right. Athanasius was wrong. And so that's where they come from. And so <clears throat> he seemed to be winning the argument and convincing all the delegates when a hermit from the deserts of Africa sprang to his feet. He was clad chiefly in a leopard skin. He tore this leopard skin from his back, disclosing great scars, the result of being thrown into the arena among the wild beasts which he had survived. With his back dreadfully disfigured by animal claws exposed to their view, he dramatically cried, these are the brand marks of the Lord Jesus Christ. I cannot hear this blasphemy. He then proceeded to give a strong and stirring address, setting forth clearly the truth as to Christ's eternal deity and the deity and personality of the Holy Spirit. And as a result of this unnamed African hermit, the, the the day was carried uh, for Athanasius, and Arius was then banished into exile. So just kind of interesting, thou has not denied my name. Praise God that they had not denied his name, and, and certainly here in Pergamos, they had denied his name. And then he goes on and he says, thou holdest uh, fast my name and has not denied my faith. And again, this is in Satan's stronghold. Despite the, the, the challenges of higher learning and academia and these, this great library where there would be great challenges uh, to his name uh, and to his faith, the believers there had held on to the truth. And oh, how important it is, isn't it, to, to, to hold on to the truth. In, in days when it's been challenged, in academia, when it's been challenged by the establishment, when it's been challenged on every hand. I heard an interesting story of a, a, a preacher in California who had kept the church open throughout the whole pandemic. And he was um, basically taken to court. And in court, uh, they were mocking him as a preacher. And they say, well, what do preachers do anyway? Uh, they don't have any purpose whatsoever. You know, what's, it, what's the point? And anyway, this guy, he said, um, he said he, he didn't, he got up and for a whole hour, he talked about the Pilgrim Fathers coming and the importance of the word of God. And he said, like the Lord just gave him what to say. And he was able to winsomely defend the ministry of the word of God uh, in, in that, in that hour. And, and so again, here, despite tremendous opposition, they had not denied my faith. In the days where Satan's stronghold was right there. And so what a wonderful commendation. They had not denied faith in the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in fact, some of them had paid the ultimate price. Wasn't quite like Smyrna, where many were uh, facing death, but there were some that did face death. He says, I, I know thy works where thou dwellest, and, uh, and even where Satan's seat is, and thou holdest fast my name, has not denied my faith, even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. So this man, Antipas. And his name is very instructive. It means against all. <laughs> and sometimes I think as Christians in our culture, we almost feel like we're all antipasses. 
we seem to be against everything. <laughs> the current trend of society, uh, you know, they, I just was uh, listening to a guy, Calvin Robinson in England, who is a, a Church of England guy who affirms biblical marriage and men and women. And, and like, talk about a voice crying in the wilderness when the whole church is being swept into the, the, the kind of the woke mentality of today. And here's this young fellow standing up and, and he seems to be against everyone. Martin Luther, when he stood uh, and, and against the powers of the Vatican, he seemed to be against everybody. And increasingly, it seems like we're against all. Now, faithful martyr, the word martyr, Greek word martyrs, is simply witness. In fact, it's already been used in Revelation 1 verse 5. It says, from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness. That's exactly the same phrase. Faithful witness, faithful martyrs. Isn't it interesting? I find this fascinating, but what a compliment to give to Antipas. He is given the same title was, as was given to the Lord Jesus, faithful witness. Now, again, just an, an interesting aside here. The word martyrs uh, is a very interesting and suggestive word. In classical Greek, it, it always means a witness, and Martus was one who said, this is true, and I know it. It is not until New Testament times that Martus ever meant a martyr. In other words, the New Testament gave the word witness a very new dimension. They witnessed with their blood. They witnessed with their death. <laughs> In other words, these people who saw the risen Christ, and we know that of the apostles, most of them died as martyrs, didn't they? Well, why was that? Because they said, this is true, and I know it. <laughs> and they couldn't deny it. And so they paid the ultimate price with their death. And so the martyrs took on a whole new meaning. It, it was not just witness, but witness, including being able to witness with your death. I will not deny this. This is true. I know it's true. I cannot deny it. I will not deny it. And as a result of it, they lost their lives. And so this man, uh, Antipas, and again, he was he was actually uh, put in, uh, we, we know from uh, church history that he was put in a brass bull, which was heated up until it glowed red and basically he died in that brass bowl that was the end of antipas and the lord says even though he's probably unknown to many he said i know about this guy he was my my faithful martyr who was slain among you where satan's dwelleth so 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 far so good um you held fast my name. You've not denied my faith. Some have even paid the ultimate price uh, saying, this is true. Uh, I, I, I will not deny it. I really believe it. But then we come to this word, but. And we've seen it so many times. It just is a, it changes everything. Everything's going well, but he says, I have a few things against thee. Because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. So we know Balaam was an Old Testament prophet who was hired by Balak. And uh, the purpose was he was hired to curse Israel. And he, he couldn't. He could not curse those who God had blessed, but he was greedy of gain. Uh, he, he wanted the rewards of unrighteousness. He wanted the money. And so what did he do? Well, he couldn't, he clearly could not curse them. And so he, he taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel. And how did he do that? Well, Balaam knew that he couldn't, they could not be defeated or cursed, but they could be corrupted. Balaam could not get God to be unfaithful to his people. So he got his people to be unfaithful to God. And so, and again, you see this in the context. 
you've had all this martyrdom, Smyrna, and, and even Antipas, who would not be unfaithful to God. So if he can't do that, what's Satan going to do? He's going to use a different tactic. If I can somehow corrupt God's people so that they become unfaithful to him, then he'll get upset with them. And that's the mentality. And of course, sexual sin and idolatry always go hand in hand. And so the doctrine of Balaam was compromise. And now that same doctrine that we read about in the book of Numbers, we see it now here again. He's saying to the people, uh, again, Satan's behind this doctrine of Balaam. Uh, false teachers in Pergamos were trying to get people to compromise. Drawing the people of God away from holiness, away from separation, away from obedience to the Lord, and to compromise and yield to pressure. So, two temples for emperor worship. Well, you know, it's okay to respect the emperor. You, you could always offer a libation. Nobody would mind. It's not such a big deal. Um, you know, it's, it's still worship the Lord, but you don't get all this attention, all this hassle, you see. Just, in other words, just take the easy route. Um, in that culture, take the easy route. Don't stand out. Don't be, don't be, don't be against all. You know what happened to, to, to the faithful martyr Antipas, uh, just, just go easy now. Don't compromise a little bit. And so this was the, the mentality uh, to, to, to compromise, to yield to pressure. And that's why it's not like Smyrna. Smyrna. Smyrna didn't compromise. No compromise. And they paid a heavy price. Pergamos is facing the same problem, emperor worship, but they're compromising. You want to earn a living right you, you want to be successful well just a little bit of comp it doesn't hurt anything you know just just you know go along with it you know go to these these business associations where they offer libations to the to the emperor and you know you just you'll be fine don't worry about these things it'll all work out so so that was the one thing the doctrine of balaam then he says so so hast thou verse 15 also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. So notice that they're holding these things. That, that's the interesting thing. Uh, we, three times we've got this idea of holding, don't we? We have uh, holding fast to my name and my faith. That's good. But now uh, you've got those that are hold the doctrine of Balaam. And you've also in verse 15, so hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Now, in the previous letter uh, in Ephesus, they it was the deeds of the Nicolaitans. Now it's the doctrine. It's become a settled doctrine, and there are people now that hold it. And so it's the it's the clergy laity system, something that God hates. Right? We said the Nicolaitanism it means to conquer the people, and and we all have different callings, different gifts, and yet we're still one in Christ. No one has a preeminent place in the church but Christ himself. Servant leadership under the headship of Christ. But now there were those that were asserting themselves above others. You've got Constantine. You've got these bishops. Remember, we saw that last time uh, in Ignatius talking about deal with the bishop as if he's God himself. And so you've got these men that are taking on uh, positions that really uh, do not belong to them. And so it's now become a settled doctrine. There are those that hold this tenaciously. They believe it and they hold on to it. And by the way, today, the doctrine of the Nicolaitans is held very firmly in much of Christianity. That this clergy laity, and you read it in commentaries, they're always talking about the clergy and the laity. And again, it's not a biblical idea. In fact, uh, biblically, all God's people are clergy. <laughs> uh, if you look at First Peter, you'll see that. So, just so, what's the Lord's message to them? Where this compromise, this this doctrine has taken hold, the uh, clergy laity, the, the the doctrine of compromise has become held, uh, and and these people that they're, they're casting a stumbling block. Uh, just like Balaam did before the children of Israel. So what does the Lord say about this? He says, simple message, repent. 
Now, not just repent, but notice what it says next, or else. Now, that's a pretty serious thing. When the Lord says to a people, repent or else, <laughs> you want to pay attention. You want to listen very carefully. He says, repent or else, I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Remember how he revealed himself? The one that has a two-edged sword. Where is the two-edged sword? It's in his mouth. And so he said, I'm going to come. Now, notice the language. Very interesting here. He says, speaking to the church as a whole, I'll come unto thee quickly and will fight against them. Now, who's the them? Well, the them is those that hold the doctrine of Balaam and the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. He says, to them, I will come. I'll come, again, I'll come to thee against the whole church, but he's going to specifically deal his blow against those that hold these doctrines and that uh, compromise clericalism, and he is going to deal with them. And again, how do we deal with them? How do we deal with it today? Well, we deal with it with, this, with the two-edged sword, the word of God. It's the word of God that always corrects compromise and corrects error. It's got to be the word of God. We have to confront people with the word of God. Thus saith the Lord. This is what the scripture says. This is why we do what we do. This is what we believe. And then he says to all of them, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. Are you listening to me? Like here's the Lord threatening, repent or else. <laughs> and he said, are you listening? And again, we've got to listen to the word of God. When, when pressure to compromise is ever present today on every hand, it really is. Uh, pressure to give in to clericalism is on every side. He says, listen to my word. Do you have a ear to hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches? And notice he says here what the Spirit is saying to the churches. This is written to a specific church, but it's it's much more relevant in a wider context to all the churches. Do, do we have the possibility that we could compromise today? Sure we do. Do we have the possibility that we should give in to the clergy laity system? I mean, think about it. If you get somebody in, do all the work, you know, then we, we can go home and kind of kick back and watch tv i don't have to do it. let him do it. that's what he's paid to do and the pressure is on life's busy uh, lots of things we could be doing with our time and so uh, all of these things are, are there as ever present challenges to us and so we're going to stick to the word of god but to the uncompromised person the lord does say he has something for them the overcomer remember that uh, he that overcomes, one that believes, one that believes God, one that believes God's word, one that stands firm on the word of God, him that overcomes, I'll give to eat of the hidden manna and will give him a white stone. And in that stone, a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth. So again, we just need a little bit of background here. So we might just say this, that unless they compromised, they wouldn't get invited to the trade guilds. They wouldn't get invited to the, uh, you know, kind of the, the dinners where, uh, yes, there was a little bit of uh, pagan worship, a little bit of offering, acknowledging the emperor, but, but business deals were made there. That's how you, you, you get by. That's how you succeed. And, and that's how you feel like you fit in in Pergamos. And, and if you, if you compromise, then you'll belong, you'll feel much part of, of the society. Uh, and, and if you, if you stand firm, if you hold fast, uh, then you'll be an outsider. You won't have uh, the all these advantages all these benefits and the lord is saying i will more than compensate for anything you lose in pergamos because i will give you to eat of the hidden manna now what is he referring to when he thinks of the hidden manna well there was a pot of manna put in the ark of the covenant wasn't there it was hidden from the sight of men and manna represented that true bread which came down from heaven it's the lord jesus and so the idea is this that the true overcomer may not be accepted 
in the trade guilds may not be accepted in general Pergamos society. But let me tell you something. The one that's loyal to me, he will enjoy an intimacy with me and a closeness to me in the holiest of all. <laughs> that is so much better than anything Pergamos could ever serve you up. And by the way, there's nothing like intimacy with the Lord. Enjoying and feeding on him in his presence is a delight to the soul. He is the, really the hidden man. And we can experience that relationship of the overcomer and enjoy intimacy with Christ. Of course, the white stone, different uh, views on this. I'm going to give you some of them. One is that it was a uh, jury had a white stone and a black stone. A white stone implied innocence. A black stone implied guilt. And so if you repent of what's happening, the Lord says, you'll be acquitted of all charges. You'll be considered innocent. That's one view. Another view is that there was such a thing called a hospitalist stone. And a hospitalist stone was, it was like a calling card. You, somebody gives you a card and say, you're, you're always welcome at my house. Okay. You can come uh, anytime you want. I'm giving you my card. This is where I live. You can come anytime you want. You can come. So this hospitalist stone is what some people believe is in view here, that the Lord is saying, you might not be welcome in the tables of Pergamos, but you're always welcome at my table. Come and dine with me. Now, again, it's a beautiful thought. I love this. Some see it even as reference to the high priest. Remember the, the, the stones that were uh, in on his garments. And uh, the idea is that just that closeness and intimacy with the Lord. And a new name is given as well. Uh, it says that the white stone and stone new name written, which is a new no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth. And again, the thought is that we can enjoy intimate thoughts and of the person of Christ that are unique to us. Every time we spend time with the Lord, it's a unique thing. Uh, it's our own personal enjoyment of the Lord and learning something about him that's unique to us. Just look at John 14 for a second and verse 21. Just a, a, a kind of interesting scripture. Uh, John 14, verse 21, it says this, uh, he that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. And so again, here's somebody who's taking the word of God seriously the commands of Christ. He's keeping them. And the reason he's doing it, not out of any legalism, but he loves him. He loves the Lord. He that loves me he says, he'll be loved to my father and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. And I think this is the promise here to the overcomer. Hold fast. Don't deny. Don't trip up at the stumbling blocks of compromise and clericalism. Stay loyal to me and you will enjoy an intimacy with me. I'll reveal myself to you. I'll re reveal things about myself to you that you wouldn't know or find in any other way. So catchphrase in this particular letter is holding and casting. Holding fast or casting a stumbling block. Some were holding good things, others bad. Some held to wrong doctrine, doctrine of Balaam, doctrine of Nicolaitanism, but they, they did still hold fast to his name. Some were casting a stumbling block like Balaam, tempting believers to compromise because they've had so much persecution. They've witnessed so much persecution. Just anything for a quiet life, just compromise. Think of the advantages. Now, we talked about these letters having a significant Old Testament illusions. We, we saw in the first letter, the Garden of Eden, that he can eat of the tree of life. Uh, we saw the second one, a picture of the book of Exodus. You got um, Pharaoh and the, the cruel but limited time space persecution, 400 years of bondage in Egypt by, by Satan or, or Pharaoh, a type of Satan. And this one, it's much easier to see what the Old Testament illusions. See, we're in the wilderness. And so there's illusions to both Exodus and Numbers right here in this letter. 
We have the manna. We have Balaam and Balak. These are all wilderness experiences. Balaam was slain. Just look at Numbers 31, verse 8, by the way. Just interesting that he was slain with a sharp sword. Numbers 31 and verse 8. It says, and they slew the kings of Midian beside the rest of them that was slain, namely Evi and Rechem and Zur and Hur and Reba, five kings of Midian. Balaam also, the son of Beor, they slew with the sword. <laughs> so we've got, we've got the Lord with a sharp sword, and he's going to come against those that don't repent and that hold the doctrine of Balaam. Just as he as Balaam was slew with a sharp sword, sharp sword. So the manna, Balaam and Balak, Nicolaitan doctrine reminds us of Korah and the gainsayers. Remember again, this is the book of Numbers, chapter sixteen. Uh, Korah, they, they wanted the same position as Moses, and the modern day clerical system want the same place as Christ. The, the Pope, uh, you know, again, we've got Constantine here, wants to be the head. He, not content with the role God has given them, they want preeminence. And so you've got Korah and the gainsayers. You've also got the idea of dwelling because Satan dwells there, but also in the church, we also know the Lord dwells in the midst. And just as in the wilderness, the Lord dwell in the midst. And so we've got that same picture. By the way, isn't it good to know and to remind ourselves that even if we live in the place where Satan's seat is, and I wouldn't be so presumptuous to say where he is today. I have no idea, really. It could be in Hollywood, California. I don't know where Satan's seat is right now. I'm, I, I don't know. But it's also possible to have a company of believers in the very place where Satan's throne is who still hold fast to his name and do not deny his faith. It's still possible for him to dwell in the midst of them, but they must be wary of the pressure to compromise. And I suppose if you're in a place where Satan's throne is, the pressure is great to compromise. But the message of this letter, and it's a very important letter, is this, that to be married to the world is adulterous towards christ he's seeking a chaste virgin <laughs> a spouse to one husband even christ and so we have to just examine our own hearts he that has an ear to hear let him hear what the spirit's saying to the churches what is the spirit saying to us as part of his church is there areas in my life where i'm compromising for an easier life because if I am, I'm giving in to the doctrine of Balaam, which is compromise. And tragically, the church compromised. They exchanged the rags of persecution for the riches of being married to the state. And the beginning of Constantine and the church-state relationship, which has always been a disaster for God's people. And so, again, we have to ask ourselves, do we want the easy life or are we, willing to, are we willing to hold fast? May God encourage us with these thoughts this morning. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you.